Welcome to Digital Asset News to get top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and bring them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, some disturbing news, I have to be honest with you. First up, Susie Swap Chef sells all of his holdings as the community cries wolf. If you've been in the DeFi space, you know that it's highly volatile, and this story explains exactly what a big deal that actually is. Also, blockchain voting, one of my pet projects, shines at the Michigan Democratic Convention and what we can all expect, hopefully, in the next one to five years. Continuing on with the vein of politics, Joe Biden 2020 tax plan has been released a couple months ago and I finally got a chance to take a look at it. And I gotta tell you, if you think you're gonna make some uh, impressive gains over the next one to five years with cryptocurrency, this is going to affect you greatly. And finally, that'll take us to Key of the Day, where we take a look at high risk versus low risk and the potential rewards that you can get. Before we do that, let's take a look at the market. So today it is Saturday and it is September 5th. Looks like about eh, 1 p.m. Texas time. Not too bad. And the market, I got to tell you, a little concerning. So we reached the $10,000 level on the downswing. So now we are sitting at 99.95. Not something that I was uh, not expecting. I kind of uh, thought it would actually drop down a little bit and then bounce back, but here we are. And uh, if we fall below 9,900, uh, I can see 8,000 uh, Bitcoin being hit. And that's just the name of the game as far as cryptocurrency. Now remember, in March, uh, just five months ago, we were at around $4,000, okay? So if you are new to this area, do not freak out, do not be alarmed. This is not the S&P 500, we are not NASDAQ. We are cryptocurrency digital assets. And when we see huge swings like this, this is just par for the course. You have to stay in there, have your strong hands and don't be alarmed. Just realize that this isn't the first time this has happened. This isn't the first rodeo. This is gonna happen again and again and again. So buckle up because it's gonna be a bumpy ride. But the gains that you can expect or hopefully can expect are mighty and it's just gonna take time. So right now it's uh, on that downswing, but uh, hey, if you don't like it, just stick around, it'll change. Also Ethereum blows past the $400 mark and is down at 322. So I expect that to probably go to 250 or so now before we bounce back up, but who knows, down 17%. Tether's Tether and XRP is XRP. Although not too stable, now we're looking at 23 cents and maybe we can drop below 20, uh, who knows. The most interesting thing though here, is Bitcoin Cash has had a resurgence and it's come from, I don't remember, seventh, eighth, ninth place, somewhere around there. And it's all the way at the fifth place and it's 24 hour volume is 3 billion with a market cap of almost four. And the question becomes then is why did Bitcoin Cash jump Chainlink? Well, obviously because because Chainlink dropped 22% and uh, the darling Polkadot dropped almost 30%, obviously. But I think there's something more to that. I think that there is another story behind that. And this was something that we covered a couple of days ago where we're gonna talk about the Bitcoin hard fork. I will link this in, in the uh, description if I can remember to do that, but I should. But uh, there's a hard fork coming. It's gonna happen on November 15th. It is between uh, Bitcoin Cash and another faction. And it's all about miners and the taxes that they're going to impose of 8%. So one side wants to do that, one side doesn't. But if there's a hard fork, and you have Bitcoin Cash, what does that mean? Well, you're gonna have another fork of another fork, and that could potentially lead to gains. However, I don't like to play that game, but some people do, and they will buy into Bitcoin Cash because potentially they can have Bitcoin Cash and the new fork of whatever it is. Just like there was Bitcoin, then Bitcoin Cash, then Bitcoin SV, then Bitcoin Gold, then Bitcoin Potato Foot, or whatever the hell it was. Uh, there are so many different forks of forks of forks. I don't, I'm not into that, but some people are, and that could be why there's a little bit of a, of a gain here, but who knows? We're all in that downward slide, so we'll see how this uh, pans out. But uh, I would like to see some more information on that, that is for sure. Anyhow, Chainlink, oof, big, down bigly, 22%, and it's uh, below that $10 mark. You have to understand, with Chainlink being an oracle, it can pull outside data in, and that is a big plus because blockchains can't pull outside data. So they need an oracle like Chainlink. Now with the fall of DeFi, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, um, hey, Chainlink isn't being used quite as much, but the big thing is, you have to remember, smart contracts, as they start to become more prevalent, and when they start to be used more in society, Chainlink and other oracles will be a big part of that. So I still believe in Chainlink, and right now, hey, Downward slide, what are you gonna do? 
polka dot also down um, pretty massive to almost 30 percent and again this is uh, one of those new projects that just came out of nowhere but it is part of that what i call the ethereum mafia this is from dr gavin wood who was a co-founder of ethereum and uh, when it first came out people were telling me that i had to get in i had to get in had to put in a bunch of money and i told you don't do that just dollar cost average like everything else and here we are down to 383 uh, when people were saying you know what six bucks is only you know the the a stopping point it's gonna go to 8 10 15 20 calm down <laughs> this isn't this isn't the first rodeo i know how this game is played and it's gonna go down it's gonna go up and all the way around so just dollar cost average in should be okay what else we got Nah, pretty much everything's pretty down. That's all I can say. So, da da da. Neo's down. Cosmos is down. Wow, 20%. Nem. Oof. V Chain, 12%. Yearn.finance. And you can see DeFi are taking a massive hit. Uh, Yearn.finance at one point was at 36 or 37,000. Now it's at 20,000 a coin. So, um, yeah. UMA, jeez, 45%. That is huge. And uh, on and on we go. So, like I said, if you're new to the game, don't worry. This is par for the course. We'll see how it all plays out, but I am in here for the long haul. I am not here for a day-to-day -day occurrence or a week or a month. I'm here for the next 20 years. And uh, that's how I see these markets. All right, let's move on. First up, Sushi Swap. Chef sells all his holdings as the community cries wolf. Now, before we go on, I need to make mention that uh, I believe in DeFi. I believe at some point it will uh, be a huge dent in centralized finance, and I think it's a necessity. Having said that, I believe that these are the early days, and with early things and early adoption, there sometimes are problems. And uh, you can see that with what's going on right here. And this is just par for the course, so let's see what's going on. So scrolling down, it states the hype of DeFi seemed to come crashing down on the 5th of September after the anonymous founder of Sushi Swap sold all of his tokens with many yelling exit scam. And I gotta tell you, in this place, in this sector that we are in, the word scam is thrown around a lot. Is everything a scam? Debatable. But uh, there are some things that um, we can see as definite scams. Uh, BitConnect, that is definitely a scam. OneCoin, that was definitely a scam. Is this a scam? Sushi Swap? I'm gonna let you be the judge. So here's what's going on. Master Chef had already announced his retirement on 4 September via a tweet. He stated, and just so you know, Master Chef is the creator of Sushi Swap. So he states, with all the growth of at Sushi Swap and the FUD, I'm considering transitioning the admin control of Master Chef and DevShare address to a multi-sig address behind TimeLock. So not a big deal, right? So he wants to transfer it over. We don't see the issue, right? But <clears throat> it gets worse. The chef finally asked community members who believe in the project to stay through the migration and become part of Sushi Swap in the long run. However, as the chef sold all of his sushis, the market got alarmed and everyone started calling it a scam. Which I got to tell you, when you're the creator and you sell all of your shares, that doesn't instill a lot of confidence. And this is the same type of lesson as in 2017 as we're going to see right now. As a justification, the chef tried to highlight the example of Charlie Lee, the founder of Litecoin, who in 2017 also sold and donated all of his Litecoin in 2017. First of all, I do not believe that he donated all of his Litecoin. I mean, he sold it all, that's for sure. As far as donation, I don't know the percentage, but I know he did. I mean, he says he does, uh, did, so uh, I'm not going to say he did not, but there's he did actually sell it at the all-time high, which is perfectly timed. So Charlie Lee, hey, he sold it all. But again, that doesn't instill a lot of confidence. And the reason why he said he did it was because he said he didn't want to be behind uh, the different uh, ebbs and flows of the project. He said that he had he felt like he had too much power with uh, his different uh, Twitter account, that he, when he would tweet out something, it would either raise the price of Litecoin or drop it down. And he didn't want to be a part of that whole thing. So that's one side, which is admirable, and I can get on that. And then the other flip side of that is people to say, oh, I just want to make a bunch of money. I'm not here to debate that. I'm just saying that when you sell everything, it really doesn't instill confidence in the project. So moving on, it states, however, a part of the community didn't take the, com the comparison seriously. Twitter, Twitter user stated, hey, Satoshi Light 
was there from 2011 till 2017 doing a proof of work coin. Your claim that this is in any way similar to that what he did is redonkulous. Not that his exit was smooth or something, but at least it was after six years of proof of work. And I don't know how long it took to create sushi swap, but I'm guessing it wasn't six years. With the community divided, the anonymous chef continued to state that this was done because they care about the community. At Naomi Chef or Nomi Chef concluded, all I can say is, if this experimentation goes on to success, you guys know the upside, but if people don't believe in the project, it will fail, and we return everything back to the original creator at Uniswap Protocol. I am happy with either result, but I have to tell you, if you sell all of the sushi coins, which is what it is all based upon, the governance coin, um, you essentially sold out everything. And I don't think that really, like I said, instills much confidence in the uh, project. Now, I can see both sides of the argument, but to me, I wouldn't touch this project in any way, shape, or form. Let me know what you think in the comments section. I just found this very interesting. And I got to tell you, as we see decentralized finance start to sell off and the cryptocurrency asset market slide, I can only see a worse slide coming up over the next weeks and months. It's all about what you believe. Do you believe that cryptocurrencies and digital assets are going to be here for the long haul? Do you think that they're going to just take off over the next couple years to five years to 20 years and that they are going to make a huge impact in the global economy and how we interact and do things? Or do you think this is just a flash in the pan and that's going to go away in a year and we're just going to go back to the regular way that things were without digital assets. If you think that, then you, maybe this is time to sell for you. I'm not giving you advice, but uh, that might be your option. For me, I believe that the genie's out of the bottle and you can't put it back in. I think cryptocurrency digital assets are gonna be here for a very long time. It's gonna swallow the whole internet. Uh, it's gonna be what they call money over internet protocol or MOIP. And there's gonna be some fantastic changes coming about just like what would happen with the internet. And it's gonna take place over the next, you know, one, three, five, 10, 20 years. And that's why I'm in it for the long haul because I believe that things will change for the better. I could be wrong. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on. Next up, blockchain voting shines at the Michigan Democratic Convention. And this is one of my pet projects because I've always believed that, that blockchain voting can really change things for the better. I mean, blockchain can change things for the better, uh, you know, end of statement. But voting, I feel, is just one of those things that really needs a major upgrade. If you think banking is old school and is, is predicated on a very old technology, have you ever gone to vote? Do you know how old-fashioned that is? You stand in line, these super long lines, and you're just waiting there for sometimes hours. Sometimes, I mean, in some polling places, it's like it's like eight hours plus. And you're just sitting there and you're waiting, and you have to step up, and you have to show your you know your ID, and they have to you know do everything. And okay, great. Then you then you step up to a voting booth, and if the you know if the tablets aren't working, which has happened last year, then you got to put it on paper, and you're like really on paper. Make sure you have the the right pencil and you have to you know set it all in and then go through the things and it's like this is where we're at in 2000 well this is 2019 in 2020 are you kidding me i can open up a bank account from anywhere in the united states and it takes like 20 minutes i can verify everything and i can start swapping out money all over the place but yet i can't do a vote this is ridiculous and mind you banks suck so something like this, I don't see why it can't happen. Anyhow, what's going on here? So blockchain-based voting app Votes has recorded nearly 2,000 votes at the virtual Michigan Democratic Party Convention. Votes has conducted pilots in several U.S. states, including Arizona, Michigan, and West Virginia. MIT researchers, however, blasted votes early this year, blasted, claiming the app was not secure against hacking attacks. Okay, so here's what's happening. Votes announced today, this is actually a couple days ago, the successful completion of voting on the platform at Michigan's Virtual Democratic Party, held August 29th to August 30th, during which delegates remotely nominated candidates for the state's Supreme Court and other positions. Nearly 2,000 delegates voted using Votes' smartphone voting platform. So again, I do not see what we cannot use a smartphone. If I can open up a bank account, if I can get life insurance, if I can get medical insurance, but yet I can't vote online, what is the problem? And before we start talking about fraud and all the things that we hear about in the news, are we not smart enough as a society to come together and overcome the hurdles and barriers that may lead us to some type of fraudulent voting count. I mean, look, we're in 2020. 
Why can't technology combat that? I just don't see how we can't do it. Anyhow, making headlines as COVID-19 keeps citizens at home and mail-in voting becomes a hot button political issue. As a precaution against COVID-19, all convention participants attend virtually from their homes. And if you believe in coronavirus, I personally happen to believe it's a real thing, which I should because my nephew passed away from it a couple months ago. I just don't understand why we all have to stand in line to vote when we have the technology right here. We don't have to crowd together in these small little places, you know, with our masks on and try not to touch anything and try not to get infected. We can just do this, you know, distance wise. We've had all the time in the world to figure this out, but here we are. Of 2,092 delegates, 91% voted using the Votes app, while the balance voted using a help desk phone system. Great phone system, sure. There were so many unique challenges with this year's convention because of the pandemic, but the Votes platform eased many of our concerns, Michigan Democratic Party Executive Director Chrissy Jensen said. Votes enable delegates to be verified remotely and participants through their smartphones. The convenience, safety, and accessibility of voting this way was eye-opening for everyone who participated. Well, yeah, because you have everything there at your fingertips. Super simple. Let's just do it that way. Votes has helped facilitate three previous Michigan Democratic Party conventions using an in-person tablet-based system in the past. It also facilitated remote voting at the Arizona Republican State Convention earlier in 2020. Votes came in the public eye in 2018 thanks to a pilot that allowed West Virginia residents to vote in midterm elections using the platform. After deeming the pilot successful, state officials planned to roll out the tool for overseas residents in every county for 2020 voting, which would have been fantastic. And that could have kickstarted it, I mean, just in West Virginia, and then probably spread across the whole country. Great. However, they changed course after the MIT researchers claimed to uncover security vulnerabilities in the vote system. Votes responded, stating that the researchers performed their analysis in, on an outdated version of the mobile platform and relied on assumptions about the server-side architecture of the system, which they never accessed. So, you know when you update all your apps on the phone? The reason why you do that, sometimes, not every time, is because of uh, some type of vulnerability. So, if the MIT researchers were using an outdated version, why the hell did they do it like that when they could have just said, hey, we're going to test this and we want to see what's going on, so we need your updated version. Why the hell did they do that? I don't know. I don't know. Seems kind of sketchy. But they kind of, you know, screwed everything up for the rest of the voting because they just uh, botched it. Whatever. Votes also pointed out that other research teams have been given full access to source code and other components of the system. It criticized MIT study authors for remaining anonymous prior to publication. So that's a real bummer. Uh, they could have done a lot of great things, but uh, because of that research, it uh, got shelved until right now. So I will say this, I mean, coronavirus does suck. I mean, obviously for a lot of people, but uh, it is pushing us into the forefront of technology because this is how we should have done it the whole time. So let's take a look at votes. So votes, I think is awesome. Uh, if I was part of the delegation, I would definitely be looking at these guys and going, hey, you've already done it all already for you know two, three years. Let's see what you can do moving forward. So let's just scroll on this. Okay, what's this? You know, in this video, I'm not going to play it, but it was pretty interesting because they had uh, some people who were disabled, some people who were overseas, some people who had, uh, they were limited in vision and hearing. And and uh, so those people, it's very hard to go out there and vote. When you're able-bodied, sure. I mean, it still sucks. But I mean, imagine if you, you want to vote, but physically you just can't get out there or for location. So why can't we just use something like this? It seems a lot easier than you know, mail-in ballots and all that stuff. So scrolling down, there was just one thing I wanted to read. Yeah, this one right here. So this is from somebody who's visually impaired. Uh, he says, this is the perfect method of voting because I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have to find someone to drive me or get my wife to take the whole day off. I was able to do everything at home. Voting app was perfect, very accessible. Utilized the voice over my phone. It was a great experience. So again, I mean, why can't we just do it like this? And this is how it works. I thought this was pretty cool. So there's just really, there's five steps. So you request mobile voting. So you just submit a request to receive your ballot via smartphone. You download the app. You verify your entity, your identity. And this, I think, is the biggest part here. So how do they do that? So it's a three-step process. And I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm not for sure. But unlike my iPhone, like it's there's a biometric available. So I just put my thumb in there and it unlocks the actual phone. So if you can verify your identity with that, with a thumbprint, that's a hell of a lot safer or a lot easier than going to a polling station with an ID, maybe that's you, maybe it's not, I don't know. But your thumbprint is kind of hard to hack, I would say. But then also, I would, I, I read somewhere something about like face imaging software and things like that, or verify in some other way. But again, it doesn't matter. 
if I can open up a bank account, why can't I vote? Anyhow, then you vote and then you verify it. It says you'll receive an anonymous receipt. So you can verify your selections, which I think is a big thing because in some different places, they were talking about people would, would vote for a certain party then they would get the printout and it was for the exact opposite party. So I don't know what the hell happened there. But here you get to verify your vote. This is what it is and off it goes. And the great thing here is with the blockchain, you would be able to verify everything from start to finish. And that's the big deal about distributed ledger technology. So I think it's a fantastic uh, way to do things. What do you let me know what you think in the comment section? Let's move on. Next up, Joe Biden tax plan. Uh, whoever you're gonna vote for, I'm this is not a political channel. <laughs> I'm not here to change the world, I'm here to make a profit. <laughs> That's it. So, this was just interesting to me because of these are tax proposals. Now, will this go into effect? Well, I mean, maybe if Joe Biden gets elected, sure, that could happen. Or he also has to pass this through the House and the Senate, you know, Congress. So, you know chances of that who knows but these are the things this is the vision for a specific party okay not that this is right or wrong but this is just what it is and you have to start thinking about this right now because if you believe like i believe that digital assets are going to go to the moon over the next three five years what are you going to do when you are sitting on a million dollars or a million in cryptocurrency and you're like, okay, I need to pay some bills. How do I take this out? Well, now we're talking about capital gains tax, not only in the federal part, but the state part. And I got to do all these different things as far as like my income and taxes and taxes and taxes. What do I do? Well, right now it's not too bad, but here's what could potentially come on the pipe. So former Vice President Joe Biden enacted a number of policies that would raise taxes, include individual income taxes and payroll taxes on high income individuals with incomes above 400,000. That doesn't seem like much now, but imagine, I'm gonna just imagine this. It's 2016, you bought Ethereum at $10 and you bought, or you bought a thousand, right? So you have a thousand Ethereum. Well, what happens when it goes from $10 Ethereum, which was in 2016, all the way up to, oh, I don't know, $1,400 in 2017. And you wanna cash out. Well, guess what? This 400,000, it doesn't seem that much now, does it? So as time goes on, you have to understand, you might make a lot of money. And if you make a lot of money, this number that you think is unobtainable all of a sudden becomes the norm. And now you're like, well, wait, well, how much I got to pay in that? Well, if you're sitting on a tax bracket, I don't know, it might be 28%, 32%, 30, I forgot, 34%. Let's just say a third, a third. So a third of everything that you have now has to go to the government. And I don't know where you're at in the world. This is just for America. But I can tell you right now that taxes around the globe vary greatly. And there are some states that just are some states, some countries that just are awful and some that are pretty good. But we have to start thinking about these things now as opposed to paying the piper later on. So Biden's plan raised taxes roughly by 3.8 trillion over the next decade on a conventional basis. 3.8 trillion, which is, you know, a good amount of what we printed from nothing. On a conventional basis, the Biden tax plan would lead to 7.8% less after-tax income for the top 1% taxpayers. Okay, so if you're a Jeff Bezos, hey, 7.8% less. Think you'll be okay. 1.1% lower after-tax for the top five and 0.6% for the other income quintiles. Nice word. All right, so moving down, moving down. This is the interesting part. Taxes long-term capital gains and qualified dividends at the ordinary income tax rate of 39.6% on income above 1 million. Again, that may seem out of reach right now, but as time goes on, this might be the norm for you. I don't know. Lastly, it states, increasing the corporate tax rate 28% would account for the largest revenue gain, which is 1.3 trillion over 10 years in the plan. So that's corporate taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Lastly, higher taxes levied on taxpayers earning more than 400,000, that could be you, including higher tax rates on ordinary income, as well as capital gains and dividends would raise another 1.2 trillion over 10 years. So again, plan now for what's gonna happen later because there is nothing worse than being caught short with a ton of money. And you're like, ah, now I got to give away 33% or 25% or I mean, heck, even 20% is a lot. So if you have time, I'm going to link this at the very end of this video. It's how I am not going to pay any crypto taxes moving forward. And I talk about how I do it, the plan that I do it and how I do it legally. And that's the most important part. And really it all comes down to risk and safety. And that's going to lead us into question of the day. So let's jump in the office. All right, everybody. And welcome back to the office for Q of the day. 
uh, to Saturday, so a little more of a casual day. But uh, what I have, it, it's not really, really a question, but it is a, an email that was sent to me by Espartano171. And he or she uh, states uh, on another topic, and he's talking about this, this thing that we were talking about as far as like putting money into, or your US dollars, into stable coins during the uh, instability. So he says, on another topic, you had a key point in the crypto space, which is putting your money into stable coins when the markets are volatile. I have a personal experience to share, which is he put, he or she put CRO, CRO in crypto.com. He said, when I bought it, he said he spent 1100 almost $1,150 when it was a nickel in value. So, you know, hey, pretty good, right? Uh, locking those funds into the three-month term certificate of deposit at 18% PA or per annum. So uh, that is how much he's going to make per year, 18%. So, you know, not that much, but a hell of a lot better than any bank you're going to get. I'll tell you that right now. And he, he or she states, it, it made me 3x on my money, uh, $3,159 uh, thanks to appreciation and $120 in interest. So total capital gain was uh, $3,159 plus $120 <clears throat> minus the original investment. So it came out to about $2,000, which is 286% in gains. And he talks about uh, another, another deposit I had with Tether. It was 8% per annum, and it made me $17 on interest, uh, which is pretty awful. So when I was first reading, I was like, well, I mean, you know, 18% per annum is pretty good. But of course, the big gains were putting it into uh, cryptocurrency digital assets. And when I first looked at it, I was a little bit confused. I'm like, what was this, uh, the actual per annum, what, what he got? But of course, it was just the certificate of deposit. So what it says to me is that if you're able to do this, which I, I think it'd be kind of tough, uh, especially with the way that our brains work, right? Uh, which I talked about yesterday. It would be tough to just buy cryptocurrency digital assets and just put it into an anal ledger or into a wallet, uh, hopefully a cold storage, right? And then just forget about it for, for uh, uh, at least a minimum of three months and then just see what happens with it. I got to tell you, um, from the beginning of, of this year, of 2020, if I would have, well, actually, I kind of did it. I mean, I just don't, I don't really sell anything. But just to put your money in 2020 into uh, cryptocurrency and then open it up right now, I mean, where would you be? It, you, you'd do pretty well. Uh, or in March, and if you could do something like that, and then off you go. So I think... If you're looking for like these these monstrous gains and uh, to, to go everywhere, I mean, you can you can look for the new DeFi thing, or you can look for uh, the new hot topic or the new shiny object. But I think the best way is just to you know a simple strategy, which would be you know just make an investment, put it into a wallet that could be a percentage yielding account. Um, my two big ones are Voyager and Celsius. Um, because, I mean, you could just live off, off the interest if you have enough. Now, granted, it's going to take you a lot, of, a lot of money, depending on where you live, like I talked about. If you're in Costa Rica, you don't need that much. If you're in Upper Manhattan, you need a lot of money. So it just really depends on, on, on how you get it. But, I mean, if you're looking at, like, interest rates of, like, 8%, 10%, 12%, and, you know, you've made a lot of money in the cryptocurrency market, I mean, it's feasible that it could actually happen. I just am waiting for that moment, and... Uh, I've got nothing but time, so might as well just sit on the investment and see what happens. Anyhow, uh, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. Uh, let's jump back. All right, hope that answered some questions. So to finish up, I just want to let you know that there is a join now button underneath. It's not like you get anything special. It's just like a tip. It's like a buck ninety nine. And uh, what I do is I just give out random shout outs. So random shout outs to Regina Halasinski, Justin Ross, Doug Lemley. Who else we got? Carlos Gomez, GK SML. As Rails Passage, I think I nailed that one, and Gene Holland. I just want to say thanks to everybody who has signed up. Really appreciate it. If you like these types of videos, there's going to be two more that's going to pop up in your left and right. Not for sure. I'm going to try to get the other one, but uh, that's what we got. So if you like those, go ahead and check those out. And that's it for today. So thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.